What's up, sons? It's Blind Run with Son of a Tech, and today we're going to take a look at the first Cabby Lake or first official Cabby Lake build for the Son of a Tech channel. And it's going to be super special because not only is it going to be a Cabby Lake CPU, but we're also looking at a Pascal GPU as well as a mini ITX form factor, all for around $1,200. So stick around. Alrighty, so to start things off, we will take a look at the case, which is going to be the Cooler Master, and it's the Cooler Master Elite 110. It's a mini ITX form factor case that does advertise to fit up to 8 inch GPUs, and we'll talk about the GPU selection here in a second. Another couple things or notes about it is it does feature two USB 3.0s with, with your typical HD audio in and out on the front panel and the power button is actually on the front of the case on the Cooler Master logo which is cool and pretty neat I should say and it lights up blue so that kind of wraps up the case it's a pretty tight fit it will fit uh, luckily up to a couple three and a half inch hard drives if you're interested in that as well as a full size power supply so while it is a pretty small and compact case it does feature support for pretty much any full-size components as long as you're not trying to put all of the full-size components in and we'll talk about that here so you can fit up to four solid-state drives but if you use four solid-state drives you're not going to have any room for three and a half inch drives if you use two three and a half inch drives you're not going to have any room for solid-state drives so that kind of is the way it works everything you add you end up having to take something else away effectively now that also comes down to GPU height now while it does feature support for a dual slotted card into the case if you went with like maybe a card that sat a little bit higher with that cooler you're not going to be able to fit a three and a half inch drive along that back not that I think you would want to anyways because then you would be probably starving that GPU of air. For the motherboard, we actually went with an H170N Wi-Fi from Gigabyte, and this is because the client or the person I was building this for didn't actually want, well, he didn't actually need to use anything like Optane, but he did need wireless Wi-Fi, AC, and Bluetooth support. Now, as you guys might know, there's not really any mini ITX H270 or Z270 boards that support both the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth at the time of making or putting this build together. So a quick note on that is I did have to update the BIOS. The BIOS came shipped with BIOS F3, I believe it was, and we needed to get up to F20. Now that doesn't mean there was three through 20. I think F3 was the latest before the release of Cabby Lake, but I did have to pop out my 7600K, pop that into the Gigabyte board, boot it and I downloaded the BIOS onto a USB stick, plugged that into the board. We did this all outside of the case just on top of the box so we knew that we could get everything working because replacing the CPU in the case in that tight form factor wouldn't be very fun, just FYI. So do it beforehand if you guys go this route. And you just update the BIOS to F20 and the 7700 which is the CPU we went with, went ahead and booted right up. Now, the reason we went with the 7700 is A, because we wanted to save a little bit of DOSH, um, but still have like the support of the latest uh, CPU and have an i7 with hyper-threading. This can, PC is mainly gonna be used for Blender, to my knowledge, and it just seemed like getting those eight threads, even if we're giving up like the high single-threaded clock, would still be more important than even say something like an overclockable 7600K, just because Blender is really, really multi-threaded heavy as far as everything, all the performance reviews I've read on it. And then that's just kind of why. We're also gonna be able to not have to worry about power and heat as much because it does consume a little bit less than like the 7700K. To kind of round out all of the system memory and uh, CPU stuff, we did get 16 gigabytes of RAM. We just went for the kind of baseline, I guess, value RAM from Crucial, and it's just gonna be the 2133 megahertz. I don't notice a huge performance benefit in faster speed DDR4. It doesn't seem to help as much. Now, 
there might be some cases where it does and if you guys know of any definitely leave it in the comment section below just to help some people out finally down to the nitty-gritty the last big piece of the project is going to be the graphics card now if you guys haven't seen it, I have a review of the Gigabyte GTX 1070 mini that you can check out and it's a very good card another thing that makes this card very ideal for a small form factor build like this is that it does have actively cooled VRMs so you aren't going to have to worry about that GPU memory overheating or anything like that so we did throw that into this build and it comes in at 6.3 inches now that 8 inches would make cable management a pain in the butt I definitely recommend keeping it under seven inches so you have a little bit of room back there maybe so you can like what i did was just kind of loop it up around and then stop uh hit the power at the top of that it made it a lot easier to have that gap back there especially when you started putting in front io and all that sort of thing i don't think that you want to go with the absolute limit in this case of eight inches i just don't think it's something you want to do personally now the motherboard does support m.2 and because this is a small form factor build, while the 600p from Intel isn't necessarily the, doesn't show the performance benefits for M.2 as something like the 960 Pro or the RD400 from OCZ, it does still provide the convenience of being tiny and out of the way, especially on this motherboard where the M.2 slot is actually on the bottom of the motherboard, which is pretty neat. So we got a lot of things packed into this motherboard. We have Wi-Fi, we have Bluetooth, we have N NVMe support, we have Caddy Lake support now, and just, oh, and get this, we have not only the Wi-Fi support, but we also have dual NICs. So this motherboard could be used for a really awesome like wireless home storage device with like a NAS and you could set up like an MCS connection and it would be super speedy so that's something to keep in mind if you guys are interested in that kind of build finally for scratch storage we just have a two terabyte seagate barracuda drive and it is a three and a half inch drive and we are able to fit one and it's on the top right next to the power supply and it fits pretty well i mean once again this is where that eight inch gpu probably wouldn't fit because i ran the cables right up there like all three of those so the SATA the power cable for the hard drive and the power cable the the 8 pin adapter for the GTX 1070 all kind of go up back behind the GPU between the front panel and the back of the GPU and yeah so keep that in mind we were able to fit that all in though and it looks great and two terabytes of storage extra scratch storage is pretty awesome especially coming in at the price of that Barracuda which is like what we're looking at 69 bucks for two terabytes. That's hard to beat. Finally, powering it all is going to be the Corsair CX750M. A couple reasons for this. A is that we are in a mini ITX form factor, so I wanted something modular. B, the reason we went with the lower end or the semi-modular is to save on some cash. And then C, while we could get away with like even probably like a 500 or a 650, probably 650 is right where I would want to be at with like a i7 and a GTX 750 or <laughs> GTX 750, a GTX 1070. Um, the CX 750M is maybe two dollars more at most on Amazon than the 650, so you might as well just get that extra power. It's not any larger in dimensions there's really not any benefit to getting a smaller well to getting the 650 over the 750 so that's going to wrap up all the parts so let's talk about performance the performance ended up being right about where i expected it to be now the lowest score for an i7 uh, i guess this generation that i've seen recently because i've had like 370 700k builds and we overclocked all of them is going to be this 7700 and the 7700 gets a score of 878 in Cinebench, which still beats out everything like the 4770K, probably the 4790K at stock clock, and, you know, gets us in that range of, uh, uh, gets us about in that range of that 6700K performance, but, you know, at a non-K kind of cost. And so we save 50 bucks there, we save... We save more than 50 bucks because we also save money on power consumption, ideally, and, and cooling, uh, I think, is the big one there. So you always pay in cost for something, and when you're doing a mini ITX build, 
yeah, I just, I, I, I find it worth it. In Fire Strike, it scored quite well with a score of 14,849. Now, an identical system to this was just benchmark that we built for a buddy. We'll give a shout out to some fellows I work with, but because I keep saying a buddy, but yeah, we have we have a uh, Shadow and they, and then Dane, which he needs a he needs an alias real bad. But Dane's build, he actually just finished a 7700K with a GTX 1070, and that scored about 15,000 in Fire Strike. So a 14,849 for 50 bucks less on the CPU and in a much smaller form factor is pretty good and respectable. You're talking about something that's, you know, like, really it's shorter than an Xbox One and just a little taller. If you cut the Xbox One in half and, like, set it on top of itself, you know, that's probably what you're looking at in size. Well, if you sell maybe like two and a half on top of each other and cut it in half, yeah, that's where it would be at. Which is pretty impressive. You're talking about, you know, a 1440p gaming machine in a super small form factor, which is really cool. And I like to be able to do that sort of stuff. The graphics score was 18,000 and what? 202 with a physics score of 12,500. And 92 and a combined score of 7,000. And you can obviously see there that the physics score is kind of where we're falling short there. That graphics score is right on par with any other uh, stock 1070. And finally in Time Spy we had a score of 5,634 with a graphics score of 5,765 and a CPU score of 4,992. So that's all the benchmarking I was able to get out of the way. This was obviously for a client and it's the, the system's already out. You can see that I already have my Cooler Master XB Evo. I've been working with Cooler Masters lately. Um, a, a couple of notes. The side panel on the left had some issues like reattaching. And so it felt a little flimsy, which was kind of disappointing. Um, the rest of the case, you know, for, for what, 60 bucks? I mean, you're getting a small form factor that has some pretty decent features. There's some things like they just didn't put thumb screws for the GPU mounts, which was kind of like, why wouldn't you? Because they did for the uh, case side panel, because it's like a all-in-one side panel. It's like three sides, all-in-one kind of thing. So I don't know. That was disappointing. But since we are talking about small form factor, we obviously need to talk about temperatures and noise. Um, so during IDA 64 with FPU, so keep that in mind, this was FPU and system memory test. The only thing that was turned off was like the GPU and the drive tests. We did get a total package temperature um, peak of 95 degrees Celsius. However, if you're talking about doing it without the FPU, we were sitting below 80 degrees Celsius the entire time. So this is the worst case scenario. And you will, like, while Ida didn't show any throttling, technically you would start throttling by about 1% at about 94 degrees Celsius. So it does have the potential of possibly thermal throttling. But if you look at each of the individual cores, none of them actually hit 94, so we didn't actually hit that Intel throttle issue there. Keep in mind, I didn't turn any of the C states off or anything like this, and this is an H series board, not a Z series board, so I didn't do any overvolting or block overclocking or anything like that. And finally, GPU temps. Now, you might be surprised. You might say, well, of course, these GPU temps are gonna be terrible. They're not. The GTX 1070 Mini, once again, Check that out if you haven't checked my review out of that. It's a very good, cool card. And we never saw it go past 78 degrees Celsius during 20 passes of Fire Strike and 20 passes of Time Spy stress tests in 3D Mark. So we're looking at super good temps. Not only that, what's really cool is the fan does go ahead and turn all the way off. So it's whisper, whisper, quiet. Now I did try to take some noise samples, but it was kind of difficult. I'm going to have to see if they sound good enough and we'll do Q, uh, Q noise samples now if that is going to work and if it doesn't, here's the deal. You can't really hear it until you ramp up to 100% on the GPU kind of thing or 100% on the CPU. The GPU fan noise is going to be in the review for the GPU and the CPU fan noise is the stock Intel cooler. So. The new one is kind of essentially the same as it was on the Skylake series, 
it's not super loud and annoying but you can definitely it is definitely audible and it does have that kind it's a different kind of noise you know um, but you can look up sound or noise samples for that individually as well and that's going to wrap it up for noise in conclusion i think this is a very cool build i think being able to do like this 1440p gaming in a very small form factor for a reasonable cost is something that i'm interested in and i was very excited to build let me know what you guys think about it in the comment section below. Don't forget to check me out on Patreon where I do post a lot of benchmarks and a lot of my tests early over there. And stay tuned for some Skylake and Cabby Lake delitting videos coming up later this week. And until next time, I will see you next Tuesday.